Mohan, thank you very much for your uh, keynote presentation yesterday and uh, the panel and the short presentation this uh, morning. And also thank you for joining me in my little backstage studio here. Uh, maybe we can start the interview by you just uh, briefly explaining who you are, what kind of organization you work at and what your research focus is. My name is uh, Mohan Sani and I am uh, on the faculty at the Kellogg School of Management at uh, Northwestern University where I um, direct a research center in technology and innovation and I teach courses in product management, technology marketing and uh, innovation both to MBAs and to executives around the world. Uh, currently I am uh, researching uh, three different domains. One is the idea of modern marketing and how marketing will be executed in the future using automation and analytics. I'm also looking at the applications of artificial intelligence in business, uh, really from a demand side in terms of how it will, what are the use cases for AI. And I'm also uh, looking at how businesses can grow sustainably and profitably over time, so disciplined growth. So these are some of the problems that I've been focused on, and they're really at the intersection of technology, innovation, and marketing. Let me ask you in the first question, uh, ask you about kind of that big bat you were talking about yesterday, one of the first things you, um, you mentioned. And uh, let me challenge you a bit on that. Um, if you are in a large company that is publicly traded, how do you explain to shareholders that you're doing, I mean, how do you do big bets uh, when you have to kind of be, be accountable for, for shareholders? I think it's an ex excellent question about how a, a publicly traded company can take and um, make such large bets when they are accountable to shareholders. So the company that I was describing, which is Geo in India, is actually a subsidiary of uh, a publicly traded company. It's the largest publicly traded company by market capitalization in the country, in fact. So, so the scale of the bet and, um, is, is, is quite large. What I find, and this is my anecdotal observation, um, is that there is a distinction between founder-led companies and what I would call sort of manager-led companies or professionally managed companies. Founder-led companies somehow find it easier to explain larger risks because they are driven by the personality and the charisma and the vision of the founder. Um, Take, for example, the bets that Tesla is able to, to make, and most people think that they are extremely risky, and in fact, they may run out of money, uh, but they bet on Elon Musk. Uh, so that was Steve Jobs at Apple, you know, that was uh, Bill Gates at Microsoft, and that is Mukesh Ambani at, uh, at Reliance. Uh, so the personal credibility and the charisma of a founder uh, who is driving the company and, and actually has a significant ownership, so they're actually, uh, the investors then believe that you're actually operating as an owner and not just as a manager. It's not easy, but I do find that it is uh, relatively easier for uh, companies who are led by founders, even if they're public companies, to be able to make such large bets. But you do have to keep explaining it to investors. Let me ask you about another aspect you were talking about, kind of um, trying to expand service offerings around the core. Um, how do you trade off between kind of focusing on the core and then when do you start adding services around the core, you know, not being distracted by really being an excellent in the core? That's an excellent question. Whenever a company defines a core business, you know, the logical way to grow is to expand around the core, but it can sometimes become a stretch or a bridge too far and you can dilute your capability. So there's a trade off between focus and and growth in some sense. So what I uh, find is that there are a couple of things you need to think about as you think about adjacencies and expanding the core. The first question that you have to ask is, uh, will I be able to leverage my infrastructure and my operations assets that I have built? Is it a common platform? So in the case of Geo, all of the additional services that were introduced whether it's content or whether it's uh, you know, the fiber to the home or whether it is uh, uh, enterprises and small business solutions, they still leverage a common infrastructure at the back end, which is the network. 
So that's one important thing to think about. What assets am I going to be able to leverage as I think about this new business opportunity? Similarly, the question you have to ask at the customer end is, am I selling these services to the same customer? Or am I going to acquire completely new customers through completely new distribution channels? So it's much easier and more profitable to cross-sell services to the same customer. And that's what we did. We looked at the consumer and said, if the consumer is buying video and data and voice, then we can expand into content, you can expand into digital payments, you can expand into a whole variety of services that surround. It's the same device, it's the same customer, it's the same billing relationship, but what we can do is to get a greater share of wallet. So you do have to think logically about these adjacencies, both from the back end, from a common infrastructure standpoint, and from the front end, common customer, uh, and common go-to-market strategy. Let me ask you about the capabilities needed when kind of um, going into the periphery or adjacencies. Uh, you had an interesting example in your presentation, uh, I think with a horizontal cable laying machine, uh, that's how I would describe it now, um, that you know, Geo has nothing to do with uh, uh, from the get-go basically and, and did it from scratch. How do you, um, is it, how do you move fast when you have to develop kind of new technology yourself from scratch? And, and why is this better than trying to get kind of companies involved that have a core expertise in doing this for years? Isn't that faster than doing something and reinventing the wheel from scratch? I think you have to take two considerations into view. The first thing you have to ask yourself is uh, that is this capability commercially available at a price and at a quality and at a speed that is acceptable to you, right? So uh, consider, for instance, what Geo did on the software front. We started with commercial software. We started with TIPCO. We had relationship with the, the software company. We, we, we worked with uh, Samsung you know, for the infrastructure. So a lot of the technology pieces in the stack were done through partners. We didn't, you know, invent our own ERP software or, you know, invent our own uh, base stations or uh, battery packs. But in some cases, we found that the capability simply wasn't available. So horizontal drilling was a relatively new idea in its application to laying fiber. And that capacity simply did not exist in the country. So that is a case where we had to invent our way through this and we had to own that capability. Now, in some cases, which is a third scenario, is that you may own the capability in the short run because of the lack of viable options, but ultimately you may go through a partner. Take, for example, devices. When you enter the market and your device is a 4G LTE device that has voice over LTE, it needs a special chip, there's no such devices in the market. So if you create a service and there are no devices for, for the customers, what are they going to, what phones are they going to use? So we have to actually put our own phones, private label phones in the marketplace under a brand called Life, L-Y-F. But that was a stopgap strategy. As we don't want to be in the device manufacturing business in the long run. So over time in the smartphone business, we've stepped back and now it's Apple and Samsung and all of the commercially available partners who we're working with. Then when we went into feature phones, the same thing. There was no smart feature phone that did 4G, that had all the capabilities that we needed, including Volti. We designed our own. And we built actually, when we bought an operating system, a locked operating system, it's not an Android device, it's, a, it's, it's our own OS. We're seeding the market. But again, as we establish the viability of the design and the reference architecture, we're going to farm it out to partners. In other cases, we've done the exact reverse where you start off with commercially available software, but then you realize this capability is core to us. So what we do is we move from commercial software to owned software, code that we've written, and we move from proprietary software to open source software. Because in the long run, open source is supported by a community. It's going to, in, in a, there's faster innovation and it's cheaper for us. And in terms of building our own code, we build code where we needed to build code. Again, you know, in critical parts where we needed to actually scale uh, the software in ways that the vendors had not done it. 
So I think it's really a subtle sort of combination of understanding. First, building a very clear vision of what is the capability set that will be needed. Then for each of these capabilities, ask yourself, does it make sense to make, buy, or ally? And by the way, what's the diff what is the short-term strategy and the long-term strategy? So as you can see, in some cases, we started out with buy and then later ended up with ally or partnership. In other cases, we started out with buying, but ultimately we ended up with making ourselves. And in, 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 in yet another case where there was no opportunity to buy, we were forced to make it. So it really is a multifaceted answer on how you assemble the capabilities that uh, but ultimately nothing should slow you down and when you reach the steady state, you should own the critical capabilities that are needed to continue to grow. Let me ask you about platforms. I mean, it was also a central piece in, the, uh, in your presentation, um, mostly regarding scalability as well. Um, how important is it to own or to create uh, the dominant platform in your industry, and how do you do that? You know, platforms are becoming a core competitive advantage in technology businesses. You know, whether you look at iOS or Android, or you look at uh, you know Amazon with its commerce platform um, or AWS for that matter. So, what is the idea? The idea is that rather than selling a product. Think of yourself as a provider of a platform, and when you're a plat when you have a platform, the platform does a couple of things. One thing it does it it provides leverage, which means you can build uh, products and services very quickly, and you can scale them much more rapidly than if you were sort of building individual products that weren't connected. And uh, and the second thing that it does is it generates network externalities because now you have like, if you think about Android and the externalities it creates between the developers on one side consumers on the other side. So I think that m many of the large technology companies, the usual suspects, Amazon, Microsoft, Facebook, uh, Alibaba, they're evolving into platform companies. So what we did at Geo was started out with the platform in view, the network as a platform, the organization as a platform, the product as a platform, payments as a platform. We look at the entire business from a platform standpoint. And I want to emphasize, it's not just technology platform we're talking about. We're also talking about organizational platform. The idea that you know, we created a people refinery, literally, that, that brings in people, trains them on how to run a geo center, and then puts them out into the field. And we built 1,000 of these centers within a couple of years. So again, taking an approach for templatizing every initiative, standardizing it so that it can scale. So I think if you take that perspective, you get scalability and ultimately you're able to grow so quickly that the dominance is reached in two ways. The dominance is reached, one, in terms of speed to market and scalability, but the second way it is reached is in terms of the externalities that you create and the lock-in that you get because you have more users uh, on your platform. What are some of the, if you would say, from an organizational perspective, what are some of the um, capabilities and skill sets you need in order to do or to go into disruptive innovation? If you're going to be a disruptor, the first thing that you have to do with your organization is to make it extremely agile because you don't quite know where the opportunities are. You don't quite know what exact skills will be needed and what op you know, in what way you're going to sequence, you're going to pursue the opportunities. So you have to have an extremely nimble organization. So one important organizational capability that you need to think about is how do you do agility at scale? Right? How do you build a, because it's easy to do agile when you're a startup and you have eight people, but when you have 5,000 software developers and 70,000 people in the company, then figuring out a organizational model that is modular, that's agile, that's scalable, that's very important. You also need to have uh, empowerment and autonomy because when you think about building a scalable organization, you're going to have to keep pushing decision making closer and closer to the customers or market because the people at the top get systematically removed from what's happening you know, at lower levels. So if you build a fractal model where you have lower and lower levels all operating autonomously, so you have autonomous units reporting to autonomous units, you know, reporting to the corporate. Uh, so that, that, that whole organizational model uh, is, is really agility at scale. So thinking about agility, 
but then thinking about scalability and, uh, and, 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 and including in that, that empowerment of autonomous teams. These are some organizational characteristics of sort of this fluid, nimble, yet very large organization. Because the paradox that we've grappled with in the past is you can either be agile and small or you can be big and slow. But I think now we can break that paradigm and you can be big and agile, but you have to think through modularity, autonomy, and a fractal organization where you have layers that are successively going into greater and greater depth, but it's all laddering up to a single top. How do you prevent chaos? I mean, uh, in many of the large organizations, you have rules, procedures, compliance that you have to adhere to in order to keep things in order, in control. How do you keep things aligned in, in this kind of modular setup? I think there is nothing more powerful as an alignment force than a common sense of purpose, so the vision. I think it's very, everyone should be very clear what mission we are on. And the mission at GEO is very clear. It is democratizing data for 1.3 billion Indians. Very simple. That's the mission. It's, it's data for all. In three words, I can summarize it, data for all. So once that vision is clear to everyone from the CEO down to the person at the front line, it creates an enormous alignment force because everyone knows what the deal is. The second thing that's related to this is the vision of how quickly and what end state we are going to accomplish. So when we say data for all, we had said we're going to reach 100 million people and then 500 million people. So people get a sense for what the scale of the opportunity and the mission that they're being asked to tackle is. Uh, because you have to really create that stretch, what we used to call a big, hairy, aggressive goal in the minds of people by painting the picture of what is the end state that we want to achieve. So clarity of what our mission is, clarity around the end state and the objective that we need to achieve. That's where you start. Beyond that, what you have to do is to create a clear understanding of what are the big bets we're making a few key big bets and what is the, and I really like the approach that um, Microsoft talked about in agility where you say that you always, while you're running a three week sprint, you think three sprints out. If you take that to a higher level, then you might think three months out and from three months out you might think a year out, but all of that is adjusted and adapted as you go along. So you have rolling plans uh, so that which can be adjusted and adapted based on where the opportunity are and what the market looks like, and yet you are very agile. So I think agility can coexist with discipline. It's freedom within a framework. The framework is set. The guardrails are set by vision and by you know and, and and by alignment around a common purpose. But within that, you give the teams a lot of autonomy to pursue. The pathway. So I call this fixity in vision, flexibility in pathway. Even if you're starting out disrupting in, in the geo case uh, in some areas, at some points, as uh, some of those uh, business part or business sections get into maturity and then they move into uh, basically operational excellence or Legacy execution more. and not exploration anymore. So where would you then? Uh, going forward and tapping into new areas, where would you locate kind of more the disruptive projects um, apart from the core? I mean, companies that have been around for a longer time, they already have that uh, core or the, the execution part in place. Where should disruptive projects be placed uh, from an organizational perspective? See, what is interesting is that if you have, a, if you have an established company, and that company wants to pursue disruptive initiatives, then you kind of have to create a ambidextrous organization, that the core organization which is focused on execution and then an innovation, disruptive innovation organization that's sort of held at arm's length because the core business starts to kind of uh, eat into uh, or, or, or antibodies start to kill the disruptive innovation. What is really fascinating at a greenfield organization like GEO is that disruption is hardwired into the company. Mm. So there is, you know, what that means is that as part of the core business, we have an incubator that's working with startups. We have R&D centers around the world so that we are getting signals from 
markets. We have development centers in Israel and Palo Alto and, and in Texas and you know around the world. So we are sort of constantly being informed about the latest technology trends. The team is constantly learning about new ideas. You know, we talked about the Spotify model at the Innovation Roundtable that has already been executed and is being used at G. I don't. So they're very sensitive to uh, looking at what's going on around the world. Plus, even at the board level, I'm on the board of directors, and one of my jobs is to, and the charter from the, the, the chairman is that he says, I need your help to keep us honest about trends that you're seeing in the United States so that we have the best of breed, people, technology that we're thinking about. So I think this is a very interesting idea that, that, that you can actually have a continuously disruptive organization. I think a similar organization, if you think about, is Amazon. I mean, Amazon is very similar to Geo in that it is doing disruption at scale. You know, hundreds of thousands of people, but they're still nimble. And that is because the mindset that they've created, and this is what Bezos calls the day one mentality. Every day you come and thinking this is day one in the company. So, uh, so I think that uh, if you have the luxury of creating a culture from scratch, I would say hardwire disruptive thinking into the core business. So it's not an oxymoron, it's not sort of like, you know, disruption and core. Disruption is in the core, it's in the DNA. And that's what Amazon has shown us, that's what Tesla has shown us, and I think that's what Geo is showing the world, that it can be done in an integrated way. Of course, it's much harder to do that in a company that has been around a long time. What is important kind of to enforce that culture and, and strengthening it and, and nurturing it in the way um, kind of the, the company wants to have the culture? Yeah, I think that the culture really starts from the top. Um, I tell people that you want your, your employees to do disruptive innovation. As a business leader, ask yourself, where have you disrupted yourself in the past year? What are some of the risks that you've taken that could be, very, that pushed you out of your comfort zone? And if you cannot point to in instances where you have pushed yourself out of your comfort zone and taken risks, you have no moral authority to ask your subordinates, your people who work for you, to do the same thing. So going back to Geo, I think one of the things I talked about was that in 2011, when we were bidding for Spectrum, you know, we put billions of dollars at risk to buy Spectrum that people said was worthless because there was no market for data. Now, if that bet didn't work out, if it, if it failed, that was going to be on the chairman. It was his bet. So when people in your organization see that your leaders lead by example, they work harder than you, they're smarter than you, and they take, they take bigger risks than you, then people follow in that model. You know, I, I like to say that leaders, the actions of leaders cast very long shadows in an organization. People watch what you do and how you behave. So if you are embodying that culture of, whether at Amazon it's that the customer is always right and the customer is always dissatisfied, you know, or, or sort of the, the, the uh, idea Steve Jobs had that we want to make a dent in the universe. So I think it really flows from the top but it needs to be sort of, you have to lead by example. You can't be risk averse as a business leader and expect people to do disruptive innovation who work for you. Let me apply that leadership um, principle or the question about leadership also not only to disruption, but also now what we've talked about in the beginning about you know, the autonomous uh, way or the modular organization. What else is important? in terms of leadership when looking at that fragmented uh, modular, modular organization? Yeah, I think uh, managing, uh, it's, it's important to define metrics, or what, we, what we call sort of key results and, uh, and, and, and objectives, right? so that everyone is, uh, knows what they are supposed to deliver, what success looks like for them, and you don't monitor their process, you monitor by outcomes. Uh, you also create a spirit uh, that encourages experimentation uh, but with the discipline, uh, so that you are running experiments and taking risks in a disciplined way. It also requires sort of a culture that uh, promotes transparency and trust and open information sharing so that people aren't hiding. Uh, and it requires a very active uh, development of the bench strength. 
So promoting people from within so that they take on greater responsibility and they become credible business leaders. So you have to grow people from within uh, in the organization. And I find that in, 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 in organizations like this, you get a lot of stability and a lot of loyalty uh, from the employees if you are giving them the opportunities to grow. Let me also ask you about where, where to find those people uh, that, that work well in this kind of mindset, both the disruptive mindset, but also the autonomous mindset. Where do you hire people and, and what are maybe personality traits that work well in, uh, from a human resource perspective? Yeah, I think that uh, one thing that we have learned is that uh, industry experience is overrated. So you, sh you should hire, you, as I like to say, you can hire people for slope or you can hire them for intercept. You know, so we don't hire for intercept, we hire for slope which is not what you know or how much knowledge you already have, but how quickly you can learn, particularly the younger people. Now, of course, at the senior level, you need people who have industry expertise, but we have a combination of people who have industry expertise, but also has functional expertise. People who know how to build infrastructure, people who know how to do project management, people who know how to build a sales organization. So these are functional skills that they have brought from other businesses into this new business. But then at the junior levels, were recruiting people from completely outside the industry with zero experience because they don't come with bad habits. They don't come with assumptions. And, uh, and then you grow them uh, by giving them a lot of responsibility. So you get a lot, as I was saying, you get a lot of loyalty that way. So it's a combination of having the domain expertise and functional expertise at the top, but then actually bringing people talent from outside your industry and then creating a very rigorous training program uh, that makes them into experts in what they need to do, as well as gives them the responsibility and accountability uh, to effectively run a PNL at a very, very young age. Last question, Mohan. Uh, if you look at innovation and look back 10, maybe 20 years, uh, what has changed and what are the reasons for those changes? I like to say that innovation is being innovated upon. Um, so innovation itself is changing. And I think some of the most significant developments over the past 20 years is obviously the evolution of digital networks uh, and digital technologies. So, it's a, it, uh, we started with the internet and connectivity, but now it's mobility. And then added to mobility now is um, analytics and artificial intelligence. So, we, we now are in a very unique place in history where all the building blocks are widely and commercially and, in fact, in some cases, available for free whether it is the algorithms for artificial intelligence, whether it's the availability of you know, devices or is the uh, existence of high-speed wireless networks around the world. So all the building blocks are in place. So what that means is now that the pace at which you can build a billion dollar business is breathtakingly fast. This was not possible 10 years ago or 20 years ago because you had to build from scratch. Now you can you know, you can be like Sir Isaac Newton who said that I see further because I stand on the shoulders of giants who have gone before me. So technology is cumulative. You can leverage all the past developments in building your new venture. So I think what we are seeing is a democratization of innovation and an acceleration, exponential acceleration of innovation. Now that's good news and bad news. It's good news if you join the bad wagon and bad news if you expect your legacy business to survive if you don't embrace the change. So I, I, I like to conclude by saying that we are, uh, this, this change that we are seeing is like a tsunami. And you can handle a tsunami in two ways. You, know, you can either get swallowed by it or you can have the surf ride of your life. Uh, so the only difference between opportunity and, your, and a threat is your ability to capitalize on it. So this force is coming, this force of change is coming. And it's coming much faster than it was 10, 20 years ago. So what we have to do is to, to, to be able to capitalize on it by becoming agile and by moving faster. Um, otherwise, staying still will get you killed. Let me ask you a final, final question, <clears throat> because you also talked about AI and, and gave a presentation on that and some of the insights behind it. Mm, w w there are so many new technologies flying around these days, and the speed of developing them is incredibly fast. W w what is a good approach to understanding what impact that specific te technologies have on, in the industry I'm working at? And, and where, how do I um, then engage with, uh, with those kind of different technologies? 
it's, it's actually deceptively simple. Don't start with the technology. Start with the business problem. Start with the use case. So what I was trying to outline in my analysis of AI and the business is that you break down your business into you know four areas, managing customers, managing operations, managing administrative functions, and managing risk. And within each of those functions, you know, there are specific sub-functions, like in managing customers, there's marketing, there's sales, there's customer support, and you know, advocacy. So you really need to systematically x-ray your business and say, where, is my, where are my costs, and where is my value and com differential advantage? So that's what you need to then start focusing on identifying some low-hanging fruit areas in which you're going to start developing AI capabilities. So for example, take a simple example, if I'm a cellular provider like Verizon or AT&T, I'm, I'm spending hundreds of millions of dollars on customer support because I get a lot of calls, people call the call center, same thing if I'm an airline or I'm a bank. So automating customer operations using artificial intelligence or chatbots is a great place to start. So on the other hand, let's say I am a utility company, I'm running power plants, and I have billions of dollars of fixed assets. Then figuring out how I can optimize the usage of my assets and predictive maintenance around those assets becomes the use case. So the first step really is to find the low-hanging fruit, which are the most attractive opportunities uh, where or business problems you want to solve. Then you need to look at how AI and other technologies, related technologies can help you get there. So I think if you start with the problem, identify the business case and the use case, and then work your way backwards, you will be okay. Uh, the problem is when you start chasing shiny objects, like we gotta do machine learning, and do machine learning for everywhere. You know, don't put the cart before the horse. That's really you start with the business use case and then work your way backwards. Thanks for that bonus answer. Uh, thank you for your presentations, and uh, thank you for that interesting and pleasant conversation, Mohan. It's been a pleasure. Thank you very much. Yeah.